Alexei Goncharenko was born in Odessa and is a Ukrainian politician, member of the Ukrainian parliament, member of the Ukrainian delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, vice president of the PACE Committee on Migration, Refugees and Internally Displaced Persons, and he's also founder of a Ukrainian network of educational and cultural centres. In 2014, he was elected to the Verkhovna Rada on the party list of Pyotr Poroshenko. In the 2019 Ukrainian parliamentary election, Goncharenko was elected as an independent candidate. He also runs a hugely popular YouTube channel and is a very effective communicator through digital media channels. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. All our content is also available on popular podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please like and subscribe if you like the channel's content. And do, of course, please consider becoming a patron to help us with the work that we do. Now, I'm going to put some links in the description of the video to um, Alex's uh, channel and his materials and his bio on Wikipedia. So do please check that out. Um, and really, we'll, we'll we'll start with your activism, because you're not only a politician, you're incredibly active in civil society. So when did this really fire up? When did you uh, and where did you get the inspiration from? Yeah, hello. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, you said that I am founder of a network of educational cultural centers, which are called Gonchurenko Centers. Uh, the only thing I would like to add is uh, that our network is the biggest in Ukraine, uh, a non-governmental network. We have 26 centers. Uh, like when it started, probably at first I started as an activist, uh, as a civil society active person. Uh, when I was a student, uh, I was actively involved in uh, defending of ecology, on some youth movement uh, and some some organization of events, uh, so on, so on. So that was always part of me. And then from these, I moved to politics, uh, which is quite natural. But always I was, I believe in civil society. I believe that uh, uh, this is uh, the right way to develop the country. And that's the only way to develop the country. And Russian example shows that if you don't have civil society, then you will have a disaster. That is the way to disaster. So that's why I, I believe in this. And Ukraine is very good in this. Because uh, many people, why so many people are so surprised that Ukraine uh, has not failed after Russian invasion. And like oh, many people in the world, let's be frank, we are waiting that Ukraine just would fail in several days. Even like experts from Pentagon sources international media were telling this because they were looking at Ukraine through lenses of uh, the power and institutions in Ukraine are weak and I should tell this, that's true and because they're very young Ukraine is very young democracy is a young country uh, from 1991 uh, we count, yeah, we have a 1000 years history, but that's a history but speaking about the state we just started in 1991. And uh, our institutions are quite weak. We have a lot of problems with uh, power, with authorities, with many things. But our civil society is extremely strong. And that was always some kind of our uh, bonus, some kind of our strong point. And uh, that's why we are so effective in this war. Not because of the authorities, but because of civil society. Because this is the war of Russian vertical against Ukrainian horizontal. And uh, horizontal, I believe, is always stronger than vertical. And that's why I'm happy to be part of Ukrainian civil society. I'm happy that our network is it's thousands of people. You know, we, uh, I'm saying thousands because it's like a family. We have English language free of charge for adults and children. We have dances, we have yoga. We have uh, German language, we have uh, cybersecurity, we have uh, like the youngest our student is four years old now, and the eldest, which is a man who is learning English language in Cherkasse and who is dancing there, he learns also how to dance tango in our center, he's 84. So that is uh, something we, we are proud of, and we are proud of to be a part of this 
will be like a drop in this ocean of Ukrainian uh, civil society. And that is a big uh, honor for us. So when did you really have the sense that civil society was firing up? Um, now, clearly, it must tack into, in, tack, uh, no, tap into some deep historical roots. But did it fire up immediately in 1991 on independence? Or did it take a series of kind of events and catalysts to trigger people to get more involved? I'm thinking in particular, a lot of people I've spoken to, um, their activism really came alive in um, the Revolution of Dignity or Euromaidan, yeah. as it's known here. I, I can tell earlier. It's more young people, uh, probably spoke with younger people, and maybe they started in 2013, 14, but big, also big push was in 2004, uh, when there was the first revolution, first Maidan. By the way, second, because the first was when Ukraine got independence. It's, it was called uh, Rev Revolution on Granite, uh, if I translate it right. Uh, then it was uh, Orange Revolution, then Revolution of Dignity. So I all of these revolutions were making big push, but I think that uh, the roots are much deeper. Uh, if you will go to history of Ukraine, you will see it's quite, it's quite, you know, I mean, like striking that in in seventeenth century Ukraine was democracy. That was the moment when Ukraine had its own state. Getmana, uh, and uh, it was not long time, but it was. Uh, and uh, 17th century, democracy. Even uh, such leaders of the development as uh, the United Kingdom at that time, uh, uh, Br uh, Britain, Great Britain, all Netherlands, uh, which were developing very fast and uh, which were like ahead of other countries, but we can't say that they were completely democratic. And uh, there were monarchies, and yeah, there was these uh, events of kind of uh, revolution in the end of 17th century in, the, in Great Britain. But Ukraine was a democracy. And later, Ukrainian people always were like counting on themselves and their neighbors to, to survive, because many empires were coming to our land. It, it is not just Russian Empire, which is clear now, everybody knows, but it was Austro-Hungarian Empire here, German Empire here, Poland, many other countries. They were coming to this land and they were very suppressive and very rough with the local people. And these local people, they survived because of, because of uh, these uh, communities because of this uh, help of the neighbors, friends, relatives. And I think this is very inside the, the, the idea of being Ukrainian is to be free and to help uh, like one another on the horizontal level. Uh, that makes us very different from Russians, which the idea of them is uh, to be like, uh, uh, to, to, to have an emperor, and to do what they, you are you are said to do, and uh, and and to that, that is the idea of how Russians live, and and that is makes us so different, despite the fact that Ukrainian and Russian languages are quite close, and many Ukrainians speak Russian, and uh, a lot of common in culture, and uh, like uh, of both Orthodox religion and many things, but we are very different. Uh, in, in these, uh, I can I could, can say political way of understanding uh, per, per personality. And uh, it, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because I know people uh, will say, "Well, hang on a second, are Russians genetically incapable of developing civil society?" Um, and that, of course, is not the case. But I think what's ignored here is that there are institutions in Russia, very powerful ones uh, like the FSB and so on, that. Not only do they close down civil society, they also infiltrate civil society institutions. Anything that sort of little green shoots that try to to rise up um, get sort of twisted and perverted uh, and distorted uh, by these very powerful institutions, which you know have been in place potentially for decades. I mean, it's a it's an inheritance I feel of of the way the Bolshevik regime. 
uh, tried to stamp out civil society and stamp out the very concept that there could be civil society. Do you see that continuation uh, in Putin's regime of essentially those sort of Bolshevik practices? Uh, I think, uh, you know, like it's a quite a complicated issue. We can speak about this for hours and for days. Uh, definitely. First of all, we are not Nazis like Russians are. Uh, Russian society is Nazi society today. Ukrainians are not. And I'm not saying that there is some bad nation that ethnos Russians. That's complete madness to say things like this. All nations are absolutely equal. Uh, and there are Russians who live in Argentina and they don't have anything in common with Putin and with this war. Maybe some of them don't care. Maybe some of them support Ukraine. Maybe not. I don't know. But they that's not their fault. Uh, there are uh, Ukrainians who live in Russia and who fight against Ukraine. And we have this striking example of a Russian pilot who was bombed in Kremenchuk, where he was born, it's Ukrainian city, and where his mother lives now. So he was bombed in the city where physically was his mother. And, uh, and he's Ukrainian, uh, but he is a Russian society representative. And there are Russians who are fighting against Russians, fighting Russians who are Ukrainian citizens, like tens of thousands of them on the front line fighting against Russia. And they are our citizens, they are our brothers and, uh, and compatriots. So it's not about nation, it's about society. And yes, Russian society in, is inherently weak and Russian society is inherently uh, like under the emperor, under authorities. And that is like quite a normal for them. They, they consider this to be normal. And, and that is a very big problem. Can it be changed? Yes. Uh, Germany showed us this. After denazification, after the Second World War, uh, after deimperialization, Germany became a wonderful, prosperous, free country uh, for the most developed in the world. Uh, so can it happen? Yes, but only after some process which should happen inside the heads of these people. Because Germans were digging out the bodies of killed Jewish people or others. So, so they were doing it so to understand what they did and to understand that they're responsible. Yeah, not just Hitler was responsible, no. All of them were responsible. They accepted it, and by this, they made a step ahead in the future. The same should happen with the Russians, and it never happened for the moment. It was a chance in 1990s when the Soviet Union collapsed uh but uh, that was no there was no demand from outside for this unfortunately and there was no demand demand from inside because speaking about germany we're saying this is a like a successful example but how it became real because germany was occupied no one democratic regime no one democratic authorities could do such things with its people they can't because just people will change them so that was made through a very, very traumatic experience, but, but it was made. There is no other way, probably. Russia, there was, a, there was a hope that Russia will go through this like evolutionary, like in a normal way. But it happened that these roots and like you said, institutions are stronger than these uh, uh, sense of freedom. It's not so important for Russians, unfortunately. But it's also interesting that these institutions, you said they're powerful, but they're powerful just in one thing, in suppressing their own people. Because we see that Russia is absolutely incapable of anything. FSB shows itself like zero in understanding of what is Ukraine, in, uh, in, in prognosis of how the war will can go, in prognosis what will be with the West, and all of this, so they completely, like, their work is bullshit. But one thing they can do, suppress its own citizens. That's it, manipulation, coercion, suppression, they're, they're expert at that. And I know from looking at your biography, you were arrested while on a memorial march for Boris Nemtsov. I think it was in 2015. 
And clearly, you have a lot of connections with the Belarus opposition and those trying to foster civil society and resistance within Belarus. Has it has the full scale war made it much more difficult to collaborate or even perhaps empathize with so-called Russian liberals and so-called opposition? Yeah, uh, first of all, we need to defer uh, Russians from Belarusians. They're not the same. And Belarusian people, they have much more potential for, for, for freedom than Russians. That's reality. And uh, they showed it. Yeah. Speaking about Russian liberals, that's a very difficult topic. Oh, in Ukraine, there is this debate about good Russians. Call it good Russian. And uh, are there good Russians? That's a big question. Because, like, definitely there are people with to whom I have all respect. Uh, Vladimir Karamurza, a man whom I know personally, who is now in the jail. Uh, he's sentenced for 25 years. So it means like a life sentence in reality just for his position against the war. And that's all. Uh, and there are, oh, yesterday there was a video of man, I think his surname is Mr. Krieger, I've never heard his name, who, who was sen sentenced for nine years for his post in Facebook. Uh, and he was singing uh, uh, Chervona Kalina, uh, being in the cage in Russian courts. Now, there are courageous people, there are people with dignity, but they are absolute minority absolute minority. That is reality. And many Russian liberals, so-called like Sobchak and others, in reality, they are just agents of the regime. They are just like what you said, when there is fast base infiltrating, they infiltrate in everything. They infiltrate in liberals, they infiltrate in imperialists, they infiltrate in, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, homophobic groups, they are trying to infiltrate gay groups, they try to infiltrate everything in Russia. Absolutely everything. Venediktov, another good example. You know, Alexei Venediktov. Alexei Venediktov, yes, yes, many, many of them. Many of those who try to show their liberals. Uh, some of them are not just a direct agents, because, for example, I think that Sobchak, is direct agent. Some of them, I think, are not real agents, but they are, they are liberals, but they are... Russian imperialists at the same time. So they don't, they want just another empire. They just want Russian empire to be liberal, modern, uh, but Russian empire. For them, hero is Peter the first, like who took Russia into Europe, but he did it only on the, on the surface. But the idea was the same, empire, empire, and again empire. So those Russians who see Russia in future as an empire, they are not good Russians. Whatever they are telling you, if they are telling you that they are for liberal democracy, that they are for freedom, it doesn't matter. If they see Russia as empire, that's all. For me, it's diagnosis, and uh, we can't count on them. And that, uh, are, and these are not people uh, who could do anything good for the world in Russia itself. Mm. And I think the 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 irony there is that any Russians, and there are very few, but I have spoken to a few who really talk about decolonization, who really talk about you know loose federation, or even you know granting um, you know independence to nationalities within Russia. There's vanishingly few of those, but these people are never likely to gain power, or never like to gain influence because they go against the opinions of the majority. That's true. That's true, and uh, democratically, probably that will not happen. But we will see. I mean, it's it's a good question. What will be with Russia in future? And that's an important question for us, because unfortunately, we are neighbors. And for the whole world, because uh, they are so big and so dangerous. So what will happen with them? And we don't know the exact answer. Uh, for the moment, I should be frank with you, my prognosis are not really bright. Let's focus more on U Ukraine, because, uh, you know, many, many uh, Ukrainians have spoken to or events I've been at. The questions are dominated by what about Moscow, which is entirely kind of unfair. And, and actually, I think there's not that much to learn by looking at Moscow and how it operates. What's much more fascinating, I think, is is Ukraine. And 
let's look at its future within Europe, because you're also a very strong advocate for uh, Ukraine's role in Europe uh, and for its ascendancy into the European Union. Um, and it's quite clear from the many discussions I've had with, uh, you know, academics, literary experts, civil society activists, that Ukraine feels, I know that's not very scientific, but it feels very European, feels very familiar, all the things people care about, the sanctity of life, all the things they say, to me, uh, say that Ukraine is absolutely not just another European country, but it could be a leading country to refresh, uh, you know, European culture and civic society. So what's your vision of Ukraine's future in Europe? 100% agree with you. I mean, Ukraine is Europe already. And uh, finally, uh, millions of Europeans acknowledged it. Because before this invasion, I worked with the Parliamentary Assembly, I work now in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and I, I saw this attitude, yeah, Ukraine, yeah. But yeah, you are like, yeah, you're in the Council of Europe, and you definitely, you're Europe geographically. But are you really Europe here? And this question was always like, like it was a question mark. The answer was not no. But definitely not yes also. So the, uh, it was like an open question. Now this question is answered. Ukraine is Europe. Everybody in you, uh, That's why I'm absolutely sure that Ukraine will be a member of European Union uh, with all our admirations, because uh, aspirations, because uh, that already happened in the heads of people. That's the most important. In the heads of Europeans, Ukraine already is Europe and not. So that is so important. And that is true. And speaking about future of Ukraine, I think that coming through this, I told you about strong things about Ukrainian civic society, civil society history, about these grassroots, about this helping to one another. But there are also, like always, the medal has two sides. And the second side of this medal is that Ukraine always, because of all these empires were coming and suppressing, people survived, the culture survived, but Ukrainians were always on the second rows, even on their own land. That made the, we call it, I don't know how to translate it in Ukrainian, it is called complex menshavartosti. It's uh, in translation, it's kind of a complex that we are a bit uh, worse than others. So like we are like Ukraine, oh, yeah, we're a great country, we're great people, but we are not Germany. Oh, no. We are not France. No. We are not the United Kingdom. No, I mean, like, yeah, we are good. We are, but we are not so good. And like that, that is the something which was in, and that was a big problem to build institutions. Because to build institutions, to build the state, not the nation, but the state, you need to have ambitions. You need to have these big goals and to move to them. And you need to say, I am best in this. And, you, and it's very funny because Ukraine is best in many things, like the biggest airplane in the world, Ukrainian. Uh, like technologies of cybersonic and many other scientific technologies. Ukraine, uh, basement of all Soviet uh, space industry, Ukraine, and, and many other things. So Ukraine, like... Uh, breadbasket of Europe, Ukraine, and so on and so on and so on, not even of Europe, of the world. So Ukraine is really the best in many things, but, but it, we were like always too humble to say, oh, maybe. So now, finally, I hope that will finish. Uh, this war is finishing this and is changing us. And you, today, Ukrainian people are saying, we are winners. Uh, and we're going to win, not only against U uh, Russia, but also against corruption, but also against our own problems in heritage. We can be the leaders of our region, of Europe, and of the world. And uh, we are capable for this. And we, we have this feeling inside. So I believe in bright future of Ukraine. After such, such difficult times and such challenges, but this spirit uh, is so strong today that we have a big chance. At least I could say like this. We have a very big chance. And I see the future of Ukraine to be a frontline unit of the free world. Because we, on our own example, you're saying refreshing. Yes, I like the, your word. 
because it looks like in the free world many forgot why the free world is so important why it is important to be free because people were born free they live their life free and they don't okay we are free okay so what uh, and ukraine shows why it's so important to be free because if you are not free then you will have russia if you are not free that you will be invaded if you will be killed you will be just eliminated and that's why we can't be tolerate for example I, I like it's it happens still now for example ukraine didn't vote in favor of resolution on genocide of uyghurs and i think this is a big mistake it was just right now yeah china is an important country and everything like this but we have these values and we in ukraine understand why these values matter and we can't speak about genocide of ukrainians which is happening and which is made by russia and saying Uyghurs, it's not about us we don't know it's too far that can't work like this if we believe in these values they are the same for ukrainians for Uyghurs, for germans for for anybody in the world so the same things were about belarus iran i was the one who was telling for years we shouldn't cooperate with lukashenko he is dictator yeah, that is against our values we can't be like this and sooner or later there will be big problems from them and they will putin will take belarus occupy and that will increase our risks unfortunately i was right but many 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 people in ukraine were telling me oh what for why, why we need to speak about belarus i mean belarus is belarus let lukashenko do whatever he wants to no we can't do like this the same i was here iran Oh no, Ukraine many times did not support Israel in you know, these uh, in diplomatic ways uh, against Iran. Say, oh Iran, it's too far. Okay, what we what we have in the end? Iranian drones killing us from Belarusian territory. That is the reality because you can't contain evil inside some borders. Evil is evil. You need to fight with evil. At least you need to name it and just not to be involved in anything with evil. That's all, and uh, I believe that Ukraine is now is refreshing like this, saying Germany, you can't say that you are free, that you are a great country, and to buy gas from Putin, to give him money, to kill Chechen people, to colonize Buryats, to kill Ukrainians, and saying, but we are beautiful Europeans. No, no, if you are doing like this, not. So that's, uh, that, that, that is important. I think there's a really strong uh, story there, and it's 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 one I want to do a future episode about because a couple of people have sort of asked here. Now, I don't want to say that uh, there is any justification for Russia's invasion, which there isn't, or, or for Russian imperialism or aggression. But if we look at some of the actions of Britain in the past and Europe, as you say, you know, we have enabled in many ways Putin's regime to survive. We've enabled him and his oligarchs to strip the country of its wealth, to get it to the West where they can legally protect it. We've given them all the protections of law, our judicial system. Um, their kids are entertained in our school, entertained. Their kids are educated in our schools. You can still find uh, many, many extremely rich, um, and a few of them are quite objectionable, Russians in the most expensive restaurants in London. Um, we created this environment where they didn't have to build a civic society. They didn't have yes. to build judicial institutions to protect their money in Russia because they could get it out of the country. And if you go back even further, we supported Yeltsin when he was making some seriously unconstitutional, undemocratic decisions because we thought by subverting democracy, you can protect democracy. Well, that didn't work out so well. Absolutely, exactly. You're exactly right. Uh, I can't add any word to this. That is the that is that is a lesson which should be learned, and this lesson should be learned much wider. It's not today just about Russia and Ukraine. The same we need to speak and to to tell to to think about China, for example, and and, and other countries. And we need, I, I believe that free world can be free. Like okay, not let, let us take a person. You can't say that you are really free if you are dependent. If you're just, okay, I'm free, but to, 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 to have a breakfast today, I need to go and to ask somebody. And to be heated, 
in the winter, I need to go and to ask somebody. Are you really free? Or somebody will tell, say you, okay, there is a price for breakfast, there is a price for heating, there is a price for everything. So uh, to, if the free world wants to be free, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be dependent from Russia on energy sources, from Chinese market, from other things, which we, we, from some resources from other countries, not democratic countries, not the countries from the free world. And uh, that is a very big challenge. But I believe that in the end of the day, either the whole world will be free or the whole world will be divided between some dictatorships. That's, I don't think that, that they, they for, for many decades, these two systems could coexist. I don't believe in this. That's right. And, you know, if we believe in our values, then we need to invest in incrementally increasing uh, democracy, freedom, civil society, not imposing it on countries, but increasing it throughout the world. And if we take the counter effect, uh, what we know about dictatorships is that they can concentrate wealth, especially a petro dictatorship like Russia uh, has huge unaccountable resources. And we know a lot of that goes into propaganda. A lot of that goes into GRU and subversion. Um, so let's turn to this topic, which I think I was really interested in discussing because I know you, you know quite a lot about this. How did Russia managed to engineer the insurrection in Donbass, and why did those same techniques fail when they tried it in Odessa and Mariupol? You are speaking now about 2014, about the beginning of this war. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, you're you're right, and here probably uh, there are many answers to this question. One of these is uh, the role of elites and uh, the responsibility of elites. Because in Donbass, it happened because there, for example, regional councils of Donetsk and Lugansk regions, they voted like against new Kiev and Kiev authorities to, to, to make some referendums. So they, they, they justified some kind of... Uh, um, uh, insurgency against uh, Ukraine as the state. And they tried to do it the same in Odessa. And I was, uh, it, it happened on my own eyes. I was at the, that time Odessa regional councillor. And uh, I was one of those, and I was one of the leaders of uh, to organize and to prevent it to happen here. And we did it. Uh, when they, they, they tried the same scenario in Odessa, uh, to 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 gather the meeting of the regional council to have some kind of a crowd outside shouting Russia 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 referendum referendum a Russian language Kiev junta all of this and uh, they tried to like by this to force regional council to vote for something like this and we stopped it prevented it and even more. Odessa Regional Council became the first. It was my amendment to the decision, which uh, condemned the start of Russian invasion in Crimea. I think this was a critical moment because uh, that showed the difference that people in Odessa, those who are who may who have because who are in Regional Council, it's in, in Ukrainian realities. It's often some businessmen, some people who. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know, some little bit professors. So, I mean, like, people who are calling themselves an elite, right? And they realize that this is the way to the disaster. And they, they, they state you, that you could ask, so we have a lot of specifics, but we are Ukraine. And everything against this is leading us to a huge, huge problems. Some of people did it because of patriotism because they feel themselves Ukrainians and so on. Some of them did it because of on very pragmatic reasons. They just, they just realized that here is the law, here is the state, here are the rules, this country is democratic, and that is important, so their voice matters. And this state is not democratic, they will, they will be nobody, that will become a gray zone, and they realize it and say, no, said no, we don't want. And because of this, that was a, like a common answer. 
you can you can look many other things because for example there are interesting uh, uh, surveys which are showing that for example in Donetsk and Lugansk was the lowest number of people who during their life visited a foreign country for example it was the lowest in Ukraine not because these these were the poorest regions no but there was there was no like a tradition to go somewhere they're very much like uh, uh, closed and uh, and so on so uh, also these you can try to find like many reasons for this but yes russia quite succeeded in uh, in starting some kind of uh, so called insurgency but it is so called because from the beginning, it was headed by Russian agents. I saw it by my own eyes. On my YouTube channel, there is video uh, from 2014, when uh, in a, it was April, Gorlovka. Gorlovka is, uh, is a town satellite of Donetsk. And uh, right, like pro-Russian mob, they took police department. But their lead after that came and said, Hello, my name is Bezler. I am light colonel of Russian army. So from the very beginning, it was led by Russia, from the very beginning. But yes, in Donetsk, they succeeded to involve some part of people to this. Uh, I think like I am like, I answered your question. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, it's a topic I want to dig into. I know research is only now being done in depth, but I think they also leverage networks through uh, sort of mafia and criminality, uh, as with the 1917 revolution itself. You know, a lot of low life kind of characters were also sort of bribed or involved. I mean, it's quite a complex uh, set of techniques they use to to activate that, to try and make it look organic. What is amazing to me is that it actually works on the outside world, whereas almost everyone in Ukraine knows exactly kind of what's going on and isn't quite fooled by that, at least if they don't live within a Russian sort of media bubble. Um, the other narrative, which unfortunately I still hear over and over. May, and over. May, may, may I interrupt you? Yes, like, yeah. When you are investing so big money and when you are using exactly Gebel's principle, just for people to believe in lie, you just need to repeat it 100 times, then you can be successful. Uh, that was striking for me. Last year, no, it was not last year, it was uh, this January. This January, I had an honor, I was invited to give lecture in University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I did it in Princeton, in Yale, in Dartmouth, and also there. And uh, I had a chart before with the number of professors of these very famous and great university and really great university. I'm very honored to, 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 was to, to be there. And now, by the way, we have common project with Gonchurenko centers uh, in learning English language and other things in, with, with the University of Pennsylvania. But one of professors of the University of Pennsylvania asked me, okay, I understand that Ukrainians are not Nazis, but tell me, are they, as I understand, there are real Nazis, right? And there are quite many in Ukraine. I mean, like, and it was, I said, okay, you're asking me this, and you know that Ukrainian president is Jewish, and Ukraine is democracy. So it means like Ukrainian Nazis elected Jewish men to become the president. And he started to laugh himself. I mean, but even professor of University of Pennsylvania so, yeah, propaganda and disinformation can be very persuasive. Mm. And and I still see, uh, you know, those narratives coming up. And I'll ask in a minute what the most pervasive and dangerous Russian uh, propaganda narratives are. I know not as many of them really work in Ukraine anymore, but they do still work outside of Ukraine. One of these that I still see over and over is that Russian language was suppressed. You couldn't read in Russian. You couldn't speak in Russian. You couldn't run a business in Russian people still believe that somehow those in Donetsk were ethnically and linguistically repressed. Um, and it, it's annoying to see that narrative come up over and over. I expect, though, when Ukraine liberates Donbass, which I, I, I entirely believe uh, is feasible in the next uh, couple of months, even this year, potentially, I think the list or catalogue of crimes, repressions, tortures, civil rights infringements are going to be on a scale 
that is going to be truly shocking for most people. Maybe not for you as well. But um, you know, why is there the persistence of this narrative, and you know, what are we going to discover when uh, when those territories are liberated? Yeah, what we will discover, we will discover catastrophe like always when we are liberating uh, our lands from Russians. We are discovering uh, tortures, we are discovering cemeteries, we are discovering awful things. Unfortunately, that will happen there. Speaking about Russian language, my mother tongue is Russian. Odessa is 90%, probably like 80, 90% Russian speaking. If you will watch on the books uh, or like uh, here, you will see that like a half of books are in Russian, uh, and uh, and that is absolutely normal. So uh, we don't have any repressions, and we never had any repressions of Russian language and R Russian, Russian ethnic uh, as ethnicity. So that is a complete uh, propaganda. But I don't think that it's all. It, it still works. I don't think so. But there are other myths that still work, and uh, one of them is called Russia can't lose. That is exactly Russian narrative. It's exactly Russian propaganda, which because we are Russia, because we are so big, we have a nuclear weaponry, we can't lose. So you need to deal with us. Okay, we are crazy. Okay, yeah, we lost the many battles now. But in any way, you need to deal with us with a kind of, like Macron is saying, we should not humiliate Russia. I mean, like, about what humiliation we are speaking about. I mean, if you... When we are taking criminal and taking him or her to prison, are we humiliating them or we're helping them? It's not about humiliation, it's just about punishment. It's just about you, you, you should be responsible for what you're doing, that's all. And that's not about any humiliation of anybody. So, but they try to, and as, I, as we hear even from the president of France, one of the biggest countries of the free world, the most important, it is quite persuasive, this, uh, this narrative. And it's complete, uh, like I should not go very far. Several days ago, I was invited for the Harvard University, one of the programs uh, event in Reykjavik. Uh, I was online and from Odessa. And uh, we were discussing uh, like uh, the third parts, uh, negotiations, other things. And in the end, one man said that, okay, but you know, we, and everybody were very supportive to Ukraine. Absolutely, Ukraine, we should support her. No worries about it, no question. But at the end, one man said, and I, he was one of professors, he said, yeah, but Russia is a nuclear state, they can't lose. And, and they just came ahead. And I just stopped them and said, stop it, please. Like, Soviet Union lost in Afghanistan. Was it a nuclear power? United States lost in Vietnam. Like, um, I, the rep a lot of examples when nuclear states can lose and Russia not just can lose, but should lose. That's the only way for security in the world. Because all these talkings about we need to, to Ukraine to win, but in some way that Russia will not lose. That will not work. And that is Russian propaganda and that is Russian narrative which where they are trying now to implant in people and people, oh yes, beyond Russia. Yeah, so that, they're, they're still working and uh, they, they're still uh, using it. And I, I hear these, and I hear these not just amongst Macron, who we've got used to hearing that kind of stuff, unfortunately, from him. Um, but I also hear this on the BBC. I hear this even on Times Radio. I was listening to you yesterday. Uh, channels which are ostensibly extremely you know, pro-Ukrainian, in fact. Uh, but you hear, you know, Russia can't lose because it's so big. It's got endless resources, which is clearly ludicrous you know they they clearly are lacking resources and and they they have terrible logistics um another one of course uh is the nuclear threat uh the other phrase that triggers me is escalation every time russia does something absolutely heinous it's like well that's russia oh dear every time ukraine mm. punches back ah oh, that's an escalation is this dangerous should we be worried it's that is to my mind ludicrous you know if you are Absolutely. the subject of a full-scale invasion you need to hit back in every way absolutely. you can absolutely uh, one of the i found one of the grounds for all this uh, russia centrism i can say 
uh, it's in, in, in the universities. Because if you will take universities, in all big, great universities and smaller ones, if you will take Eastern European studies, it's all about Russia. It's about Russian language, studying Russian culture, Russian history, and everything. And all these people who are considered to be experts in Eastern Europe, they really are Russian-centric. Because all their education, they, they, they visited Russia, they, they lived in Russia, they studied in Russia, they worked in Russia, and everything is around Russia. Because Russia is, but in reality, it is not. I mean, Eastern Europe is very diverse. And, uh, and there, there, that, is, so, that is one of the things which should be changed. And I see it's changing. I see it in Harvard. I see it in other universities where they started to change it and to say, OK, Eastern European is not equal Russian. You know, let's speak about Ukraine and Ukrainians uh, and Kiev. Yeah, and what started from where? Kiev was the start of everything. OK. And what about Warsaw? Uh, and, 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 and then you see the big picture where Russia is a big, big, but just a part. And uh, that will take time. That will take time. But I already see changes. I already see that many, many people are changing their minds, are realizing they were not right uh, and, and, and acknowledging this. I mean, I, I, uh, I've been on a process of, let's say, de-Russification or demythologizing. you know, what I've learned, uh, as, as you say, as someone who studied Russian uh, quite some time ago. And it, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of, uh, well, in my case, talking to a lot of different people to get a slightly different perspective on that. What worries me is that when Ukraine wins and Russia is abjectly humiliated and, you know, falls apart in its own unique way, um, there will still be you know, the myth of Russian invincibility will fall away eventually, but there will be one myth that remains, and that will be the myth of the Russian opposition, the myth of the Russian liberal uh, uh, intelligentsia. Um, it's not to say, as you said earlier, there are individuals who would fit that mold, but it's so fragmented and civil society is so underdeveloped. I think people really to get away from this idea that there is any kind of uh, organized opposition or even any ecosystem in which different oppositional factions can actually coexist. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, uh, I don't believe in Russian opposition because if it would be strong, they would not, uh, they would prevent what had happened. That's all that shows that they're not. And uh, either they infiltrate it or they are just uh, short-minded. Uh, I don't know, but, but, but they are not strong. In reality, the, the best option, what I see, is a kind of uh, external administration of Russia or its parts for some time, which will change the dynamics, which will change the textbooks, which will change the attitude. And because this attitude is much better, people will catch it quite quickly, but they will need some time. Uh, like it happened in Germany. I don't know another recipe. And uh, that is the best option. Will it happen like this? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I can't predict. Uh, any predictions will be very, very, I don't know, like not based on, on, on uh, it's very hard to predict how it will go. But that's the best option. Because Russia should be not only deimperialized, but Russia also should be denuclearized. Because we can't leave nuclear weaponry in the hands of people who are ready to use it and to blackmail with it. Because the whole idea of nuclear club is that you never ever touch it. But they completely destroyed the rules of the club. And that is very dangerous. And if it will not be stopped, sooner or later they will go nukes. Maybe not today, maybe not in five years, maybe not in 10 years, maybe in 20, maybe in 30, I don't know. But that is for them, they, they're just speaking about it. it. Nuclear weaponry is becoming more and more, those who learned r Russian culture know about this, that he, if there is a rifle on the, uh, on the wall it, in the theater, it should shoot at some moment during the spectacle, during the presentation during the spectacle that that's something which should happen and that's more and more becoming like this 
uh, speaking about this, uh, thinking about it, that is the last thing. Uh, for the moment, it looks like nuclear weaponry is the last thing which shows Russians that they're a great power. That's the last thing they have just to, to, to try to justify their special place in the world. Uh, and, uh, and that's very dangerous. And uh, to denuclearize them, that will also need probably external administration. I mean, that that seems to me this is going to seem like a, a crude caricature. But I think people who struggle to understand, you know, Russia's point of view, for me, it's like a thuggish, fairly ignorant, you know, large guy in a, in a village with an extremely big stick. Um, it it's a kind of uh, you know provincial nemujic kind of mentality. Yeah. Um, the irony, of course, is that Russia is on the permanent a, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Now that's a really without big any issue. legal grounds, without any legal grounds for this, by the way. Exactly, it automatically assumed that role that the demise of the Soviet Union without it really being questioned which of course in hindsight is uh, is an error you know it didn't earn that position and it it simply inherited it through no uh... and it's not and it's not in the charter of united nations uh it's just because everybody accepted it in 1991 but uh, uh they really they really do not deserve it so my last question here is about learning the lessons. We've touched on this a little bit, and I think it ties in with this idea of you know, Goncharenko centers and the, 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 the emphasis on education, learning and moving forward. Um, it strikes me that you know, Russia's problem over the centuries has been the acquisition of Western, the fruits of Western technology, the, the, the material manifestation of European civilization without actually studying the mechanics of politics and society that produced, uh, you know, those luxuries, that wealth and that power. Um, if we look at the Russian opposition today, they also use a lot of big concepts like freedom and they talk about certain institutions, they talk about being a normal country. I see almost no discussion of the mechanics of how you get from this point to that point and actually make it a reality. Um, and I don't see a huge amount of studying uh, being done of how Ukraine achieved that. Um, so first of all, it creates the impression that even the Russian you know, in, uh, political intelligentsia are still stuck in this mindset of Russian primacy, uh, of they know how to do things. And Ukraine, well, you know, it's a bit more of a second tier provincial power. But the fact is, you have found a way to emerge from the homo Sovieticus uh, type mentality. You have developed an incredible civil society. And so my last question is, you know, what should we be learning uh, the West from Ukraine and what should Russia really be studying much harder in terms of what Ukraine has achieved over the last 30 years? First of all, uh, freedom matters, democracy matters. That's really important. And, uh, and uh, about Russia, it's obvious, but we saw events in the United States, for example, you remember in Capitol Hill and, uh, and, and other things. So I can tell you democracy matters. Without democracy, you, you, do, you will not have a civil society. You will not have a normal life. That is important and that is vital. Secondly, definitely education, culture, that is the key. We need to work with children, with uh, teenagers, and with adults. If people can change. It's absolutely normal. But you should give them possibilities. And I can tell you that uh, our network, we had three centers in Donbass, which we unfortunately now we stopped their operation because it's a heavy fight it's there. But that was the biggest number of people coming to us because they were saying that we never had a possibility to have something different. And now we have possibility to learn Ukrainian history, to learn English language, to understand that, you know, and some foreigners, they're not just some, I don't know, crazy people and so on and so on. And, uh, and uh, by the way, we are proud and maybe anybody who is watching our YouTube to this video will watch. We, we are happy to co cooperate. Uh, for example, now we recently, two weeks ago, opened a new center in Kiev, and it was done together with Lord Michael Ashcroft from the United Kingdom in cooperation with him and with his support. So I encourage those who are interested in 
Bosnia to, 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 to help us to develop Ukrainian civil society, we can be the entrance, but you can use any others. But that is important. That's what you can do to help people today, to help to open some center, to give education to children, to learn them, to give, uh, to help culture to flourish. Uh, and, and, and by this work, uh, you will have the results. If you will not work on this, you will never have any results. So that is the lessons which I, I think we can take. And, um, and, and let's take these lessons and let's build the better world. Alexei, that's a hugely uh, inspiring way to to end our conversation. I'm incredibly grateful to you for spending uh, you know so much time talking to the audience today because I know you're extraordinarily uh, busy. Um, thank, you. thank you so much, and of course, um, uh, Slava Ukraine. Hello, Slava, and thanks uh, for your attention to Ukraine. Thanks for covering, and thanks to all people who are supporting Ukraine. Uh, that is so important for us but also it's important for everybody. All this war showed that the free world is alive and is strong. And that is, for me, it gives me optimism about the future of humankind. Thank you very much.